Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Life Off Screen. On this episode, we're going to look back to some of our favorite moments, some of the highlights of Life Off Screen 2020. And we have been so excited to bring you some wonderful guests. Uh, they have been so gracious with their time. They have shared from their heart, from their life, pearls of wisdom. We hope that you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Yeah, because we've really in enjoyed it. You know, the, whole, the way this whole thing got started is way back in the spring when COVID first hit, we made it a, a rhythm to about every other night. We would reach out to some friends on, on Zoom and just kind of check in on them, see how they were doing. In fact, one couple we found on Facebook that we hadn't talked to in 37 <laughs> years, and we must have talked for at least three hours. Mm -hmm. Well, we realized as we had these conversations, there were so many words of encouragement mm -hmm. and insights and inspiration that we thought, I wonder if other people would be interested in, in hearing these conversations. So we decided to do a web series, a podcast called Life Off Screen. <laughs> So here we are archiving some of the best of the best, and we hope that you enjoy a series of being able to introduce you to how they first met, how they have balanced career and family. So let's kick that off right now. So I'm on the treadmill and I am just sweaty and nasty and reading my Christian psychology book, you know, I'm just focused and out burst the door of the aerobics class and 25 <laughs> girls and Larry Myers. Come out. <laughs> he knew what class to take. <laughs> and uh, they're all going, bye, Larry, Larry, bye, bye, Larry. And I look up, Larry, who's this? And it's him. Head to toe, spandex. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. wow. You got to get pictures. You can't stop saying that. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> halala, halala, halala. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you, he looked good. Oh. So he mm. spots me across the room and he darts over and he mm. strikes up a conversation. And I'm just, uh, I'm thinking this guy's trouble. I am so not interested. All these girls. So he glances down and he says, so, um, he said, you're reading Jay Adams. And I said, how do you know who Jay Adams is? He's a Christian psychologist. And he mm -hmm. goes, well, are you a believer? And I mm -hmm. said, I am. Are you? And he said, I'm a pastor. And oh. I look him up and down in his spandex. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. <laughs> you pastor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to go to that church. Yeah. I, I, thought. <laughs> I sat next to her at a Vesper service. We had a church service on campus on a Sunday night. And uh, I sat next to her just totally by chance. And she, this is uh, many, many years ago, and she was wearing a hot pink corduroy pantsuit with oh. <laughs> platform sho shoes. And I thought it was the hottest thing I'd ever seen. But she was quite intimidating, so it took me three months to get up the courage to ask her out. And even then, I was talked into it by a roommate of mine, so it was very yeah. difficult. Oh my goodness, well, what, what drew you to each other? What, what did you notice, Kathleen? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> No, no, seriously, I was a freshman and I just kind of wanted to play the field. I didn't want to get connected with any guy at mm -hmm. one time. I, I want to see that what's out there. This is the day before iPhones. And so when I called her to ask her to go out to a show for our first date, she said yes, because she thought I was somebody else. <laughs> and uh, oh. there was another Phil on campus that she knew and she thought it was him. And so we, needless to say, the relationship didn't start on really well. solid ground. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> And yet it did, because I remember our first date together then in the car, feeling, and throughout the date, like I had known him all my life. And yeah, really? I it's the weirdest thing. And yet I understood, my mother had always told me growing up that I'm praying for your husband. I'm praying for the man you will marry. And mm -hmm. so I think that was God's providence in so many ways in that I felt such at ease with him. I remember him even saying later on after we had some conversations that that first night I reached over and turned the the, the radio dial on the on the radio just because I didn't like what was playing. And you'd yeah. never do that on the first date. It was like, that's how comfortable. <laughs> and he thought, that's so cool because she feels so comfortable here. And- um, But you wouldn't feel comfortable around me, Dan. <laughs> I'm telling you. Oh, of course. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> well, she would like, she would like, get in a fight with him and, and then I, oh, the I would kind of console her and deal. you know, she'd get done, get, she, they'd have a date or something and then she'd come over to my house afterwards. Yeah. Cause he and, was starting Well, we were becoming friends. 
And, and because I was like, I had messed up. I was like, I, you know what? I need to figure out how women work. <laughs> it's not yeah. that easy. I'm still learning that. One of my sister's best friend. Mm-hmm. And they dated mm-hmm. for about four months. Yeah. But then she was done with him talking about me, she said. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's great. I love it. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you, Heather, but sometimes even when, um, especially with Dan's career in comedy as well, you know, and being out of the road, I mean, you probably got this incessantly, but I used to have people come up like, what's it like, you know, being married to this funny guy? Is he I- like... So such a crack up twenty four seven. I swear I'm going to write a book called "Is He That Funny at Home?" That's oh, perfect. It. That's what they always ask, right? The way I make her it laugh was. is not safe for uh, not safe for work. Oh yeah, <laughs> how he's dressed. You have to get a little more manic he, and yeah. let's just say creative. And he's yeah. dressed inappropriately too. Right. Dressed way inappropriately. <laughs> <laughs> oh shocking. They started following the Lord, you know, maybe a year or so earlier and I just spent that time really getting to really de- developing and building my relationship with with the Lord and and um, and working on my heaven work on me and work on myself mm-hmm. so that when I did meet that person and it ended up being Carrie that mm-hmm. I was more I mean I had a lot of a lot of growth still to go through and in maturity but mm-hmm. I think at that point when she met me she said her dad said he's got potential like you, Dan, you yeah. know, it's like yeah. you had potential, even though you, he was a little sus on your you. job. It was yeah. kind of like, he's, he's going to, these guys are going to take good care of our daughters. That's something I often say to young people who are struggling right now in the world to like find somebody, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, have you made a list of what that person looks like? And they're like, oh, that's a great idea. And then I said, and then check yourself and see if they'd like you. That's <laughs> great. Happens. Truly, yeah. start who you are in, yeah. in Christ, and 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 maybe those rough edges that you have that maybe need to be polished a little bit um, mm-hmm. or smoothed out a little bit, mm-hmm. so that when you when you do encounter the person God picked for you, that you're ready, and that mm-hmm. not that all your part, all the parts of you will be perfect, right? Because I think a lot of what God did in marriage is that so much healing yes. um, happens in your in who you are within the context of your relationship with your spouse. And so you're not ever going to come to the relationship perfect, right? Yes. But yeah. potential is important. And if you don't have that community, not only holding you accountable, but supporting you, encouraging you, reminding you that God is faithful and good. I mean, it's vital. I don't know how anybody does this business, uh, uh, survives in this business for a long period of time without having something to go to. Like, like I am so glad I have her to come home to every day. And then I also am so glad I have a knowledge that there is a bigger thing than this industry. God is bigger than any of these. I mean, this last thing in Montreal we've been talking about, it was a hard project. Some days it were hard. Um, and then I think none of this matters because God is in control. God has a bigger picture than I do. I, and I, I can understand why there are people in this business that, that have mental health issues and turn to drugs and yeah. turn to yes. wild behavior because if you put your value in the projects you make or the success or failure of like mm-hmm. the arbitrary approval of a development executive who he either had a great lunch or a bad lunch when he picked up your <laughs> yes. script. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's so arbitrary. When everything split up, I mean, I think I was thinking I was, I was providing for everything that she needed. I mean, we had a home, a nice home. We had nice cars. We had all the clothes and food and this and that on it, you know, and, mm-hmm. but what I, I wasn't there. That's what she wanted. And I didn't know that. I thought I was fulfilling everything that I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so that took, you know, the whole work of coming together and figuring out, you know, how do we make this thing work to to move on once we got back together. And after that, I didn't think I was ever going on the road again. I thought when I became a believer and became a pastor that that was it. And, uh, you know, when we we did uh, in my father's house, it was it was a turning point for some reason as far as going out and making music again but i had to find the balance you know where i i wouldn't be gone for long periods of time ever number one i had not only the family but i had the church and that yes. was my responsibility so i had to balance all of that stuff out and i think that partially was part of what kind of held it all together making it work you know is that you wouldn't go out for long periods of time 
Yeah. yeah. It's kind of, you know, you guys know what the film and entertainment business is like because you've been involved in it. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not a family friendly business, yeah. sadly. I believe that the only way for you to maintain your integrity, the only way for me personally to maintain my edge in my work mm -hmm. was knowing I had a real life at home. Yes. Right? Absolutely. And it's, yes. you know, you're playing pretend a lot when you're in the film and TV business, you, you create fictional stories and, you know, and it's a very temporary kind of business because you don't know from season to season where you're going to be. Sometimes you'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll leave one show and go to another show. And, you know, I've often joked that the film and TV business is like being gypsies. You kind of wander around looking for food and when you find some food, you camp there for a while. Yes. <laughs> no, the food runs out. And then you got to yeah. go find more food. You know, and that's I love that. is, you know, for family yeah. working in this business, yeah. you have to consciously choose to maintain your family, to maintain your marriage, to make sure that you're investing back in your family because it's easy to get caught up in the, the flash of the business or the excitement of the business. And that can become yes. a drug for you. We hope that you're enjoying these glimpses into our guests' lives. Well, we've also navigated some areas with them about personal brokenness and challenges in their personal life, but also what they're navigating in society as well. You know, beyond COVID, uh, this has also been a year that has been marked with a, a focus on racial injustice. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be talking uh, to some of our guests about that in a moment. But we want to get started with a dear friend's testimony of his struggle with alcoholism and fame. Mm -hmm. I acted like I pushed everything from my childhood away and acted like it didn't happen. I tried to, mm -hmm. and, uh, but there was so much rage in me and turmoil and, and you don't know what to do with it. You haven't heard the word therapy, you know, yeah. uh, and I didn't know what alcoholism was. Um, but I, w I was living in, in such hell because I was being heralded, heralded. Uh, and, you know, you go to work and 10,000 people are telling you you're wonderful, but in your gut, you know, if they, if they knew, they wouldn't come if they knew me because I'm not good. I'm, I'm not worth this praise. Mm -hmm. So you, you have all this, I mean, all this angst in you and you love Jesus and you're singing about him and you're talking about him and you feel some relief while you're doing that. But then you go back to the hotel and honestly, yeah, I would be saying, do you like me now? You know, I, I did my best. It breaks my heart. And people came to Christ and, you know, people made decisions to serve you. You know, am I good enough? Do, do you think I'm, I'm, I'm good now? I mean, I really worked hard for you. Um, and so there was just this, you know, this, this pain, pain inside of me. Um, and we were in New York, they would have Heineken in the refrigerator. You know, I'll just drink this and it'll cool me down. Well, I, I drank one and I started feeling something. And the voices got a little bit quieter. That rage, that, that hurt, that pain, that discontent, that restlessness got a little quieter. So I had another one. And the voices got more silent. And, uh, and so I had the last one, the third one. And I, the pain wasn't there that much. The hurt wasn't there that much. Those voices of like, you're not worth it. Mm. but not there as much and and I promise the next day I lifted my hands and I started praising God I said I can live this way the hurry is gone the pain is gone the discontent the restlessness the rage it's gone Thank and you. I got really I, I, I can live this way this must be how other people feel uh, yeah. for now uh, I started this career of just, and then, you know, after a short time, it gets a hold of you. We're having to have some very difficult conversations now. Needed, mm -hmm. yes. needed. It's so needed, right? Because for a long time, for me, I just didn't want to handle, you know, confrontation. I didn't, I just kept, you know, sweeping things under the rug and, oh, they don't mean it. And, 
you know, I'm sure that's not really their heart, you know, but, but there were points where I just had to say, you know, can I talk to you? Can mm -hmm. we have a candid conversation? And I want to do this in love. I hope you know that I love you and I believe that you love me. And that is what has, you know, continued mm -hmm. this relationship. But I have to, to share with you that there are things that you've said or done or perspectives that you've spewed that you don't realize how hurtful they are, mm -hmm. yes. you know? And yeah. so I just feel like our, our love as the church right now is being tested, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. can we continue to maintain relationship with one another as a body of Christ while also being willing to confront ourselves, to confront mm -hmm. one another mm -hmm. and to allow God to heal these places, yes. right? Where, yes. where, where perhaps they've been broken. And so my hope is that, is that the church will do the hard work right? We'll do right. the hard work of breaking up the fallow ground and taking up these weeds that have grown mm -hmm. together so that we can have a full harvest that looks and feels like all of us and looks and feels like Christ. As you've noticed, all of our guests have established careers in the media industry over many years. And they share with us some of the lessons they've learned uh, along their, their journey, mm -hmm. uh, as well as they talk about the redemptive difference a Christian presence can make in the industry. We learned, and so I'm living in these hotel rooms, and I go, no, this is what we're made to do, do this together and to create family on a movie set. So God really showed us that direction um, 15 and a half years ago of how family, our family can create family. And because, you know, as a crew, when you come together, especially for a film, it's three to four months of, you know, really intense working together and, and working hard. And so I, all of a sudden we started having kids. I was pregnant living in hotel rooms and then I have newborns living in hotel rooms and loving the people, loving the crew. And now our boys are starting to work on the movie sets and they're wow. 13 and 11. I don't know at all. I'm a constant learner. And it's not just learning. You're connecting with people. You're building relationships. I love that about you. You're a seeker. You're a knocker. I'm a big believer in demystifying processes. So mm -hmm. like for instance, years ago, the very first time we went to Sundance, the thing that drove me was I want to demystify this festival process. How does it work? How does it function? Mm -hmm. Same mm -hmm. thing with can, same thing with any of the things that we get in, involved in is like, I want to demystify it because once you do that and mm -hmm. once you break it down and understand how it works, it's no longer daunting. And then you can take what's useful out of those things and mm -hmm. get rid of the rest. And it's, mm -hmm. you can move on to the next thing. And I'm doing a demo of this song when the Israelites leave Egypt and it's the song uh, when you believe. You know, um, there can be miracles when you believe that song. Okay, mm -hmm. so but when I when I recorded it as the demo, the lyric was, "You can do miracles when you believe." So when mm -hmm. I leave the studio. We're all sitting out having lunch out in the break room, and uh, I, I'm sitting there with the music supervisor, one of the directors, and one of the producers. And I said, "You know what? You might have a problem with that lyric." And they said, "Really?" I said, "Yeah." Well, I said, yeah, because in, in Jewish orthodoxy and Christian orthodoxy, we don't believe that we do miracles. We believe that God does miracles, and he uses us of, as instruments of his miracle power. They said, really? I said, yes. So uh, wow. they said, well, uh, I said, you might be better served if you change the lyric to there can be miracles when you believe. Right. And I said, you're going to avoid a lot of issues with every denomination and stripe and religious religion out there. And so um, they ended up changing it to There Can Be Miracles When You Wow. Are. That is amazing. Uh, much to the chagrin of Stephen Schwartz. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. <laughs> Not really. Not, he was okay. No, but that's just such, you know, wonderful proof of what we've talked about in the past. Yeah. Of just it's, uh, believers being a part of projects and yeah. being able to make a difference and you never yes. know how that's going to happen. Yeah. Start every day nice. seeking God. Jesus started every morning early, even in the dark, saying, Father, what are you doing today? Can I join you? Mm. And the Lord says, of course you can. Yeah. And then you see what God's doing and you just join him. And it really makes for an adventure that we yes. could never drum up ourselves. I think it's important to say 
to whoever's going to hear this is that God sees you. Mm -hmm. It says in the Bible, he knows the number of hairs on your head. And that says he cares about every detail of everything mm -hmm. that concerns you. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in some of the darkest times of my last marriage, a, a complete stranger, a woman who obviously knows the Lord, came up and did not know my story, but she, out of her mouth, she said, you know, you'll never need an alarm clock again if you just ask the Lord to wake you up in enough time to get what you need from him that day. Wow. And I began doing that and it changed my life dramatically. And then as I began ministering to women and God would just speak to my heart about what they needed to hear and what kind of study to do specifically and watch fit broken family relationships get restored and forgiveness mm -hmm. and re-honoring parents out of the command of the Lord. And, and because it works and it, these are eternal mm -hmm. things that will never let you down. And so, you know, each step I found that you make towards the Lord, he'll just blow you away with blessing you and showing mm -hmm. you how much he loves you and he created you to do life with you. Yes. And it's just the most glorious thing. And, and, it, and it nev it's like this never ending well inside of yes. life and joy and peace and purpose that never goes away. I just, I just love that. That was such a good word. Well, we're going to wrap up our uh, 2020 highlights with uh, a couple wonderful stories of faith and answered prayer. What was happening for me was that I kept receiving prophetic words from strangers saying that one day I was going to work with Oprah Winfrey. And then also one day I'm going to work with Tyler Perry. I'm like, Okay, so I'd received all these words. And then finally, Kelvin and I were in Georgia, where, you know, it's the home of Tyler Perry Studios. Mm -hmm. I said, before we go to the airport, I want you to drive me to Tyler Perry Studios. He's like, and we know we're going to miss we're our play. I'm like, trust me, late. I have to go there. So I, we drive up there, and I ask the guard, is there any way I can come inside? Can I go on a tour, you know, a quick tour? He's like, ma'am, no, absolutely not. This is not open to the public. I have no idea who you are. And then he hands me a postcard. And he's like, okay, thank you. Bye-bye. And so, you know, of course, I'm crestfallen. And I get back in the car with help. And we're driving away. And then I just tell him, stop the car, stop the car. And I hop out the car. I run back to the gate. And I just put my foot underneath the gate. And I just prayed over the property and I said a scripture. I said, wheresoever the sole of your foot shall tread, God will give unto you. And then I raced back in the car before the guard could call the police. <laughs> and we drove so. on to the airport. And sure enough, you know, years later, I was driving back up onto that same lot again. But this time as a star on a show from Tyler Perry and Oprah Winfrey. My dream was to be Carol Burnett. Mm -hmm. And to work with Tim and Harvey as a kid, that's all I wanted. Wow. And I used wow. to pray about that when my little Italian mother would take me to the Catholic church, she'd give me a quarter and she'd say, here's a quarter, light a candle for the souls in purgatory. <laughs> I would light a candle and I would always say the same thing. Please God, I just want to meet Carol Burnett and work with Tim and Harvey. Please God, I just want to meet Carol Burnett and work with him. <laughs> now this is how God hears the prayers of little wow. girls. I get a phone call. Hello, Mr. Ward. This is Tim Conway. Uh, Harvey Corman and I would like to know if you'd like to join us and do a show with us. Come on. I Whoa. met them at Gary's on. Deli in L.A. They walked in. You know, across from Jeff, Hallmark. Across from Hallmark. Yeah, right. Yeah. They walked in. <laughs> when I looked at them, it was like I know them all my life because really I had because I had yes. studied them so much. We sat there at Jerry's Deli and we put the show together. And for 15 years, it was just the wow. most lovely. It was terrific. I would wow. have to punch. The, I, I, honestly, you guys, every night before I went on stage, I'd pinch myself and just say, God, how did you do this? Well, we hope you've enjoyed these, uh, these highlights. And we want to, again, thank our guests mm -hmm. for being so gracious and giving of their time yes. and sharing their, their lives with us. And we want to thank you yes. for tuning in to each episode. And you, as you know, you can always go on mastermedia.com and you can watch the full episode. So if these snippets have been something you want more, we've got it for you. Great stuff there, as well as getting them on podcasts wherever you hear your podcast. So God bless you. Thanks for being with us and have a great new year. Thank you for joining us for Life Off Screen with Dan and Peggy Ruppel. 
Life Off Screen is produced by Master Media International. Our technical director is Jason Rugg. Please subscribe to the Life Off Screen YouTube channel or subscribe to the Life Off Screen podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. You can leave your comments in the comment section. And to find out more about Master Media, go to mastermedia.com. Thanks again for joining us. Hope to see you next time.